Right, I greet you in the wonderful name of Jesus. And then, um, yeah, this video, video is just a small video that, I, that I've just had on my heart to do. And it's very simply titled, Why Jesus? And you know, um, let me just say this firstly. If uh, I, I don't know if the signal will cut out, but if it doesn't, um, I'm going to try and do this live. If not, I'll, I'll record it and upload it sometime. But the title to this is really, Why Jesus? And, and, you know, do we need blind faith to believe in Jesus? And, and you know, I want, that's what I want, by God's grace, for us to look at a few things today, because you'll see, if you bear with me, that God has made it abundantly clear to us that Jesus is who He said He is. So... I just want us to look at a few things. So, it's also got to say I'm not the best artist in the world, so I won't quit my day job and become an artist. But here goes. Oof. Okay, it's even worse than what I. Okay, this is planet Earth. Let's draw a little bit of land mass. Good thing I didn't go to art school, right? Sure, okay. So this is planet Earth. You're going to have to use your imagination for this. But this is planet Earth. All right. Planet Earth is in a mess. And um, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to, to realize that in this day and age that we live in, that the Earth is in chaos. And I also just got to just say this. By the way, this is not a disk. This is a globe. But that's a whole nother topic for another time. But yes, we live on this globe. And it's a mess. And you know, many people would ask, you know, the question of God. Where is God? Does He exist? Let me turn this a little bit so you can see this. Does He exist? Why doesn't He send help? Why does, it, does He care? Why doesn't he send us a savior or, or someone to help us out of this mess that we're in? Let's draw a small person there on this earth. All right. But now the problem with that is this person here, how would we know if God sent this person? How would we know that he was in fact from God? Because, you know, many people have claimed to be God's messengers, God's prophets, God's son, even some God uh, have claimed to be God himself. In the past year, I know of two people that I've heard that have claimed to be Jesus. So how would we know for a fact that this person here would be sent from God? And you know what's amazing about those that have come to make, make claims, most of them it's, uh, have said, don't worry about the past, and if we can draw a timeline here, somewhere here, let's draw it over here. Don't worry about the past, I've come to fulfill something from God. But because God is outside of time, if I can draw God's timeline like this, and it's unending because God is outside of time, would it not stand to reason that God would be able to give us evidence here before any person's lifetime um, clear evidence that whoever this person is is in fact sent by God and that's what I want to, us to look at today because you know Jesus made some very clear and specific claims um, there was a place in, uh, in, uh, in the book of John John 5 he said to the Pharisees he said search the scriptures and he, by saying search the scriptures, he was talking about the Old Testament because at that time the New Testament didn't exist. He said, go and look what is written um, because you think the religious rulers now, you think those things give you eternal life, but those things testify of me. They are written about me. So he said, I don't have to prove myself. God has proven me. Go look. Go look what's written. And that's what, uh, by God's grace, I want us to look at this today. Because that would be God's undeniable seal 
outside of time or outside of one person's lifetime that all these things, not by one person only, by the way, but by many different people. And to do this, we have to look at the Bible. And I know there are those that don't believe in the Bible. And, and really, this video is not to prove the Bible exactly. But I want to say a few things about that, though, first. You know, you can go and research evidence for the Bible. There's the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's archaeological evidence that is being digged up over the last few thousand years. Every, you know, every now and again, they find something new. To, to prove the Bible is accurate. And you know, there's thousands, if not millions of people trying to discredit the Bible, but they cannot find anything concrete. Um, you know, just the fact that the Bible was written over three different continents, um, over 1,500 years, with 40 different authors, not just one person claiming something, uh, many different people who never knew each other claimed something. And, and Jesus made the claim, he said, those people were writing about me. All right. And, and, and this to me is the biggest evidence also. If the Bible is true, then what it said would happen is true. If God had some uh, foreknowledge of the future, then, then the things predicted should have come true. And I'm not talking about some vague predictions like Nostradamus and whoever else that have made some special claims. But every now and again, like with the Twin Towers, people said, oh yeah, Nostradamus uh, said something about that. But then they take one vague little line and they apply it to that and it's crazy to make that fit and the bible doesn't make vague statements it it's and we're going to see see when we look at it now the bible makes very specific um claims so without further ado let's 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 move on so we're also going to look at what are the odds of one person fulfilling all the things written now, this work here, um, there was a guy named Peter Stoner. He was a maths professor in, in the States. And him and 600 students, they looked at these things, um, mathematical probabilities. And they applied these rules of probabilities um, to a couple of the prophecies to see, could these things have been fulfilled by chance? Because you could even take those things and say, yeah, but couldn't any number of people have fulfilled those things and you know there's over 300 prophecies written about Jesus so they looked at eight and and I want us to do the same today Let's just look at these eight that they looked at so the first one was written in the book of Marka and we're going to read it now, but basically, basically it mentions Bethlehem. Right. All right. Fortunately, the whiteboard we have is not very clear, so you're going to have to bear with me with the pieces of paper. All right. So in, let's read this. In the book of Micah, it says, Thou Bethlehem, although you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee there shall come one to me that is a ruler in Israel, whose goings forth has been of old from everlasting. So back here um, was clearly God's seal from everlasting. Somebody that came from here that is to be a ruler in Bethlehem. So then these guys said, well, big deal. Um, Bethlehem, it could have just been any other place in the world. So what these guys went and looked at, what are the odds of the Bible getting it right and and what are the odds of the person coming out of Bethlehem versus the rest of the world? So to do this, they, they went and researched the, the average population of Bethlehem. They found that to be 7,150. And they compared this to the rest of the world, which is average population of 2 billion people at every, any given time, or average population. When you narrow this down, it comes to 1 in 280,000. So just basically of all people born, the chances of this Messiah or this Savior that was predicted to come and, and help us out of this mess, basically, <laughs> is 1 in 280,000 that, that he would in fact be born of Bethlehem. 
Okay, so the second one, he said, behold, I was, uh, uh, let's go read it. In the book of Malachi, now again, Malachi and Micah, they were different prophets, they didn't know each other, and I, and I don't have the specific dates when this was written, but it uh, it's written um, not in the same, uh, same time period. He said, behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Right? So this messenger we know is speaking of John the Baptist. So then what these guys, these students and this professor looked at, they said, of the people born in Bethlehem, how many of them have had a special forerunner or a person to come and uh, like an ambassador to come and prepare the way and you know they said this was a very specific prophecy just not any messenger but this actually meant a messenger from God so they had certainly not heard of anybody else but to give it a, a, a you know proper estimate they, they said to put a number to it they said the odds of the Bible getting this right was one in one thousand which I think is conservative then the next one they said uh, in the book of Zechariah it says rejoice greatly o, o daughter of Zion shout O daughter of Jerusalem behold your king comes unto thee he is just and he has salvation he is lowly and he rides upon a, 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 an, an ass upon a, the colt foal of an ass basically a baby donkey <laughs> so let's write, write here baby donkey so then they looked at you know normally a king would not come on a donkey a king coming into a place like Jerusalem or any, anywhere else would normally come on a white horse with a chariot with a bunch of soldiers coming with him um, he would make a great big entrance not, not lowly on a donkey so they looked at again what are the odds of um, a king coming in this way and this was again written in the book of Zechariah at the end of this video by the way in the comment section I will put these verses down and I will also reference where this um, information comes from on the net so you can go research this for yourself because really this is what I just want to provoke is before you reject the idea um, why Jesus go and look at the evidence for yourself you know God's gone, gone through a lot of trouble to give us this evidence and you'll see as this starts taking shape, you'll see that the, that the evidence is crazy um, that it can't be by chance. But okay, the next one, a baby donkey. They said, what are the chances of a king coming on a donkey? They said, one in 10,000, which I think is very conservative. Again, probably in the millions. But they decided to narrow it down to one in 100. Now, I'm not sure why they narrowed it down to this figure, but, but they did. Maybe some of them disagreed. Okay, then moving on, the next one, um, it, also in Zechariah, it says, One shall say unto him, What are these wounds in your hands? And he will answer, These are, are they which I was wounded in the house of my friends. So, again, very specific uh, prophecy. This speaks of um, Jesus being betrayed. And we know that Jesus was betrayed by Judas. So let's say uh, betrayed by a friend. Betrayed by a friend. I hope you can be able to see that. And this caused there to be wounds in his hands. which speaks about him being pierced in his hands in crucifixion, which we'll also look at later. But again, this is very specific. And I said again, what would be the chances it be of, this, uh, of somebody by chance being wounded, wounded in their hands, being betrayed by a friend, and that resulting to, to being wounded in their hands? And again, they, they, they took a figure of one in one 
thousand. Okay, moving on, number five. Now, th this is where it starts getting really accurate. This one to me blows my mind because in Zechariah eleven twelve it says, "If you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear." So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver. Now again, this is written about five hundred years before this actually happened. Thirty pieces of silver was the exact amount that Jesus was betrayed for. Now you know in this day and age we live in, it's hard to even predict uh, with with inflation. You can't even predict in this life how much your money is going to be worth in a few months with the petrol price going up and down all the time. You know, I've heard stories of people going on pension um, and them thinking that it's a lot of money that they're going to get. Uh, but then it's like a thousand or two thousand. Now, when they started working, they thought two thousand rand is a lot of money. But because inflation has gone through the roof, two thousand is nothing today. But again, 30 pieces of silver was written all these years before. And guess what? Jesus was betrayed exactly for 30 pieces of silver. So they said, what are the chances of somebody being, <laughs> uh, or, or, you know, being betrayed, uh, it resulting in having wounds in his hands, and then also <laughs> being betrayed for 30 pieces of silver? So they said one in 10,000. And they reduced it down to one in 1,000. Which again, I, I, I'm not sure the reason for, but I'm sure there must have been some that disagreed. Then the next one, Potter's Field. And also in the book of Zechariah, it says, And, and the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized at of them. And I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Now this is very, very specific. And they asked the question, one man and how many, after receiving exactly 30 pieces of silver, returned the money, the money was refused, cast onto the floor, and the potter's field was bought. Now we know this, this happened with Judas when he, wanted to, he had remorse over betraying Jesus, and he wanted to give the money back, and the Pharisees wouldn't have it because they said it was blood money. So then they took that money and they bought the potter's field. So again exactly exactly foretold some hundreds of years before it actually happened potter's field all right so the odds here they said is one in a hundred thousand which again i think is conservative can you still read my writing okay in the book of isaiah the next one it says, he was oppressed, Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, he opened not his mouth. So th this was um, foretelling how Jesus would go to the cross. And after they accused him, and, and, and you know they, the horrible things they did to him, he never, ever... Um, gave a defense for himself or, or stopped them or anything like that. So the question these students asked, they said, one man in how many, after fulfilling all the above prophecies, when oppressed and afflicted and on trial for his life, though he is innocent, he will not make a defense for himself. Now you know, we are as human beings, everybody will state their case or try and defend themselves. Would you be put to death as an innocent man? I, I wouldn't. If I'm innocent, I'm going to tell them I'm innocent. And I will state my case and make sure I'm heard. So this was, again, something very unique. So let's put here no defense or no self-defense. Right, and they took a figure of 1 in 10,000. And again, they narrowed, or they reduced it to 1 in 1,000, probably to be easier to work with. All right. And then the last one. In the book of Psalms, Psalm 22, it says, Dogs have compassed me or encircled me. The assembly of the wicked 
have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Right, now, now this is crazy because, let's say you pierced. Hands and feet. Now again, this was written a thousand years before it actually happened. Right? And being pierced in the hands and the feet, this spoke of crucifixion. And when this was written at the time, this was written by David in the book of Psalms, they hadn't even invented crucifixion yet. The Romans hadn't even come into power, and the Romans were the ones to invent crucifixion. The, the most cruelest per, uh, way to, to torture and kill somebody is crucifixion. And, and, and it's amazing that this was written so many, or a thousand years before it actually happened. So again, they said, what are the chances of, of, of this also being predicted by chance? And they took a figure of one in ten thousand. All right. I'm going to have to move on to the next page here. All right. All right. So I'm hoping you see, starting to see the picture come together. Now I've got to tell you something about odds. And using an example of a dice, right? When you throw a dice, the chances of getting a, the number three is one in six, because there's six different positions on the dice. Okay, <laughs> the chances of getting two, two threes in a row would be, you'd have to multiply these two by, uh, by one another, the chances would be one in 36 to get two, two threes in a row. To just get five Five of these in a row, right? You'd have to say six times six times six times six, which is seven thousand seven hundred and seventy six. If it took you on average five seconds to throw a dice and you'd multiply it by, by this, just you see to get five threes in a row. It would take you a few days where you'd have to sit daily trying to do this to get it right. Now, tell me something. If I had to take dice and on my very first attempt I threw five threes in a row, you would be right to ask me, let me have a look at those dice. There's something not right. Something's been crooked to this dice. It can't be by chance that you've got this. Um, it's impossible to be by chance. So now when we take all these prophecies fulfilled, only eight, eight of the 300, and we start putting this together, say so it's 28 or 280,000 times by 1,000 times by, again, 1,000 times by 10, no, oh, sorry, 1,000 again times by 1,000 times by 100,000 uh, times by 10,000 and times by 10,000. What you get to is a figure of 28 octillion, which is basically one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight. So one in twenty-eight octillion. There's a lot of zeros, by the way chance of one person, we go back to my first picture here, this one person coming onto the scene and only fulfilling eight, let's write it up here, eight of the 
300 prophecies foretold by different people live, that lived in different lifetimes of one another. To put this number into perspective, and, and, and this was what, what, what the conclusion these students came to, they said that <laughs> the state of Texas, now because it's Americans, they use the state of Texas. Now I think if you had to compare it to us here in South Africa, the state of, and I stand under correction here, but the state of Texas is about the size of South Africa. Now they said if you had to take a silver dollar, now a silver dollar is about this big, it's the size of our old one rand coin. If you had to take silver dollars, this amount of silver dollars, and cover the whole face of Texas with those silver dollars, knee deep, that would be this amount of silver dollars. Now they said if you had to take one of those silver dollars and make a, take a permanent marker and make an X on the back of it, put it back into the rest, mix the whole lot up, right? And then take a person, blindfold them, and send them into the middle of all these silver dollars. And this person must, on their first attempt, pick the right one. Um, that is about the chances of one person, by chance, fulfilling all of this. And, um, you know, never mind the, the other 300-odd prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. So, the conclusion to all of this... Let me just go back to my notes here. Is it's certainly not blind faith that God has, God has given us ample evidence of, of Jesus. But you know, when Jesus stood before Pilate, um, you know, Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life. And he stood in front of Pilate, and Pilate said, what is truth? You know, we can be faced with all the facts in the world, but unless we're willing to believe the truth, God has gone to great lengths to prove to us that Jesus is his son. You know, he's preserved his word over these thousands of years. And yes, you get different versions where, where, where people have taken, uh, tried to attack the Word of God and take things out and all those things, and, and this video is not about that. But God has preserved His Word over these thousand years so that even in this day and age, we can find out that Jesus is who He says He is. And, you know, not only did Jesus come to this earth, I'm going to have to use this page now because the other one fell. He didn't only come to this earth, oh, he is it. But he went to the cross for you and me to go and pay a price for our sin. Remember we said in the beginning that this earth here is in a mess. We can all see it's in a mess. And this is not all that life is about. You know, Jesus came, and, uh, came down and became like us so that we could become like him. Perfect. When um, in heaven he was perfect, he was righteous and just. And the Bible says he took him upon himself uh, the nature of, of sinful flesh. Yet he, ne he never sinned once in his whole life, but he became a once and for all sacrifice for sin for all of us. Now, I just want to end with this in Luke 19. You know, Jesus, Jesus said this, um, to the after he had come on, on, on the donkey he said to the people there the day shall come that your enemies will cast a trench about you and they will encircle you on every side and they'll lay you to the ground and your children with you and they will not leave one stone upon another and you know this was fulfilled in 70 AD when, the, when the, the temple was besieged, you know, because they wanted the gold in the temple, they didn't leave one stone unturned. Because as they burnt it to the ground, the gold melted and it melted in between the bricks. So exactly like Jesus said, they, they dug up all the bricks to get that. And Jesus said, this is why this would happen. Because thou knewest not the time of thy visit, visitation. You know, when Jesus came on this donkey, it was foretold in the Old Testament to the exact day that Jesus would come. The exact day. 
but because Jesus didn't fit their, what they, the picture they had in their mind. You know, that the, the Jews wanted this king on a horse, on a white horse, a mighty warrior that would release them from the oppression of the Romans, um, a strong king. And because Jesus didn't fit their description of a king, they rejected him. Never mind all the evidence. They didn't even bother to go and look at it. Like Jesus told them, go look at the scriptures. Um, <laughs> search the scriptures because they testify of me. But they ignored it. But what I want to say to you today is in the exact same way um, the things happening in the world today, the Bible says Jesus is coming again. And you know there's a day coming where the Bible says the, the, the trumpet will sound and the dead will rise first. And then we which are alive and remain, we will be caught up to meet them in the air. And this is talking about the rapture. And it's coming soon. And everything that the Bible foretold would happen in these last days is busy happening and has happened. Nothing still needs to happen before the rapture can take place. But like the people were too worried about their situation and their circumstances back then, it's exactly the same today. People are too worried about their lives, um, worried, consumed about the here and now, about this little bit of time here on this earth, and not, not worried about eternity. And, and um, if this video does anything today, I, I hope it just causes you to go and look at these things. Um, go look. <laughs> There's more to this life than, than just slogging off and, and, and struggling for 50 years, 60, 70 if you're lucky. Uh, there's more to life. There's eternal life. And it's only to be found in one person, uh, Jesus Christ. So, back on the topic of faith. It's not blind faith, but you have to believe God. God's given enough evidence. Um, and, and, and I would urge anybody watching this, from here, pray to God. Ask Him to, to reveal these things in your heart, and He will. And He'll show you the truth that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Thank you for watching. Amen.